Hi everyone, this is part 3 of Ensemble Techniques, where we cover Random Forest. So in part 2, we had seen the Bagging Ensembler. One of the things we'll do today in this video is we'll first look at the top limitations of a Bagging Ensembler. And then we'll look at how Random Forest provides solution for all those three limitations. Then we'll look at an illustration of how Random Forest algorithm actually works, following which we'll summarize what are the key elements of random forest algorithm and where it is being used. Okay. First, let's look at the limitations of a bagging ensembler. The first limitation that we do see is that we are aware that there's a 63% probability for a data point to be in a bag, which is the details we saw in the earlier video. And now that also means an outer bag, which is about 37%, is going to be common across many of the trees being generated along the ensemble process, okay? So this actually limits the learning ability of the bagging ensembler. Next, we also saw that there is no optimization for the trees or regularization, which means deep overfitted trees would be produced. And what that means is we will have some odd fluctuations caused due to these deep overfitted trees. For example, if the leaf count is too low, like one or two leaves only for a particular node, then those are actually going to have a significant volatility or variance into the overall process. The third limitation, which is very important limitation, is that the data correlation can actually be high because we are consistently using the same set of data along all the features. And what tends to happen is it fundamentally limits the ability for variance reduction in the bagging process. In the previous video, we did see how the variance got reduced, and the reduced variance of an ensemble was defined as sigma squared by t. And we also need to know that if there is correlation in the data, this particular formulation needs to be adjusted for correlation, and it does become correlation times sigma square plus 1 minus correlation by t times sigma square. So if t is the number of trees being generated, and if trees are a large number, then what this particular equation will converge to is correlation times uh, sigma square. So that's our limiting factor for having correlated trees within our ensemble process. Now let's look at how Random Forest provides solutions for all these three problems. First, Random Forest is going to be using random subspace method. What that means is it is not only going to be sampling data, but also will be sampling features when it's actually running the algorithm. The second thing it would do is it does a validation of out-of-bag errors during the training. So we'll look at that details in a minute. But what this means is for the data points which are out-of-bag, it fundamentally cross-validates its estimates when it's actually doing the training process for a given bag estimator. Third, it provides us ability to tune hyperparameters for the underlying algorithm, which in this particular case we are talking about decision trees. So it does provide us ability for us to say, I would like to have certain regularization imposed on the overall random forest optimization. And that's very, very neat and very helpful, as we will understand by its usage. Next, let's look at the algorithm illustration. So first, we are being given training data, D. The number of rows we have been given is N. And the columns, which are the features, we have been given 10 features in this particular example. And the model we are choosing is a standard addition tree, which is the underlying one for uh, random forest. Next, the step one is we are going to be generating T bags from our training data by sampling with replacement. So this is a, a fairly similar step as we saw in the bagging ensembler. But here, we are also doing one more important thing, which is we are taking both features and data points as we are sampling the bag. So the bag one is being created. It has X percent of N. What that means is if we have 1,000 rows, then this X percent would mean, let's say, 20 percent or 30 percent of 1,000 rows is part of this bag. And then the columns are selectively picked from the list of 10 columns, in this particular case where we assumed the bag is constituted by three columns, which is the features 1, 4, and 6. Okay. Next, the second step is we gen generate the base learners and then 
train the bag. So let's generate the base learner where we are going to be fundamentally looking at creating addition tree model behind the scene. And also we have to train the data. So when we train the data, an important thing that Random Forest does is it selects the best split from the subset of columns it has already sampled. So in this particular case, we have features one, four, and six coming into this bag for this base learner one. And it is going to be splitting its nodes based on feature one, four, and six, and not based on the entire features available within the data set. Okay, so that's a very important thing to know. The second important point here is it does a validation. Immediately after it has run through its training, it is going to be validating using out of bag data points. So data points that have not been part of this bag will be used to validate how well its predictions or classifications are performing. Okay, so that's an important thing to know. And one more note, which is a rule of thumb, which is very well used in practice, is that how many number of features should be selected each time for a given base learner when it's, con when it's contributing to its bag can be approximated through a function which is based on the square root of the total features available. So let's say in this particular case, if we have 10 features, then square root of 10 would be one rule of thumb approach for us to be able to identify the number of features we would like to sample from this particular list okay all right so that's what it does for its first bag generation and the second bag is generated the same way but again it is going to be doing a sampling random subsample both for data and features it creates the bag then it creates the base learner it trains the base learner it validates on the oob which is out of bag uh, data set Finally, it creates up to T bags as we have configured it. Random subsample, both for data set and also feature space. Creates this base learner T, which is based on this particular bag. Trains the base learner on the bag T. Validates the base learner for out of bag data set. And finally, prepares its uh, predictions and classifications, depending on the problem we are trying to solve. Now, once that is done, the obvious third step, final estimate, is arrived by averaging all the predictions in case of a regression problem or taking a max out in case of a classification problem. Okay, So that's how the final ensemble's value, which is a random forest estimate, is being generated, which is a prediction average for regression. It is a max out for classification. Okay, so that's the overall run of this particular random forest algorithm. And we have to note that each of this is parallelly done. Therefore, for performance reasons, we do have the ability to actually run them parallelly in multiple threads. Okay. Next, let's quickly look at the summary of where random, random forest is actually different and how it is being used. First is random forest produces better estimates than bagging ensembler. So that's an important thing to know. Second important thing to know is a random forest results are not very sensitive to data or features. That's because we have generated n number of trees by sampling both data and features, which are fairly unique for each of those bags. Okay, so that's an important thing to know. And the, the last important thing to know is random forest is useful not only for regression and classification, but also is very useful for similarity scoring your entire data set and the data points within it, and also feature importance. Okay, so we do have a subsequent video where we cover the mathematics of similarity scoring and feature importance for random forest in detail. But in this video, do take away that it is not only useful for regression or classification, but also can be used for similarity scoring and feature importance. Okay, so that's all for this video. I do hope you have enjoyed the video and give it a like if you did. Until next video. Bye from you.